Okay, grade nine, this is lesson number 11, environmental change and extinction. This is a very short lesson because we're mostly working on a lab activity um, during for today's kind of content, um, but I wanna make sure I give you guys a good grounding in the vocabulary you need to talk about this and some other examples as a one from the lab. So we're on to our fourth and last big idea here. How does environmental change impact the evolution of species? So write that one down in your notebook, please, and you'll start to answer it with today's lesson and lab activity. Okay, today's template is only one page because like I said, it's a short lesson. We have mostly a big lab to do today. So one part, what caused environmental change? You're gonna have a drawing to make here and then extinctions and a graph to make here. Okay, so let's get started. So the earth is not stable, right? We tend to think of the Earth is kind of as we see it right now in our lifetime. And we have to remember it's a very old planet and it's been changing a lot over time, right? Uh, so we've talked about some changes in our previous unit on um, erosion and climate and the weather, um, like El Nino. And this is one example of how the Earth changes. These changes can be really short-term things, like an earthquake can really change the surface of the Earth, the environment for organisms living there for a decade, two decades more, depending on how big the earthquake was. A um, volcanic well, eruption can affect an area for several decades, depending how close it was to the eruption. Um, El Nino, we know, affects climate for a year in particular and tends to last, and there's a cyclic thing happening every few years. Um, then we have big, much longer changes. We have things like continental drift, the fact that we now have the continents arranged like this, but we know that many millions of years ago, um, hundreds of millions of years ago, the continents were all connected together in what's called Pangaea. And that's a huge change because if you think about it, the when Pangaea was formed, most things were around the equator at warmer parts of the Earth. And there was nothing like the very far North Pole and very far South Pole like we have today, way up here and way down here. So the climate was a lot warmer for most organisms. That's a very big environmental difference. Um, climate change we're experiencing today, that's affecting species, and that's a big change in the environment that may last a very long time, depending on a variety of factors. So, when the environment changes, how does this affect natural selection? I want you to think about that for a second. Pause the video and really think about that. Well, one of the four principles of natural selection is adaptation, which shows how the organism is tied and adapted to its environment. So if its environment changes, maybe it's not going to be as well adapted. When we did our simulation uh, lab with the little squirrels, mice kind of things in the forest, uh, the first virtual lab we did, we looked at how if it was snowing, it would be different um, environment than if it was not, and how that would affect which species, which individuals were better camouflaged, and that affect evolution. So adaptation is very much connected to the environment, so the environment changes, then what you're adapted to may disappear or may change. What happens if a species can adapt? What happens if in that entire population there's not any variation um, of a, there's no individuals whose traits are different enough to allow them to survive? So for example, if we look at those little mice again um, and there's snow, changes, climate changes now, it's snowing almost all year round, and there's no individuals in that population who have lighter colored fur, they're all going to stand to predators. So what can happen? Well, the population can decrease significantly. You can have extinctions even if they can't adapt. Um, you can have them having to change and leave that habitat for the habitat they're better suited to. It can have a huge impact on that species as a whole. So some more examples here. Um, a historical example of this you're going to analyze in this virtual lab is the peppered moth. The peppered moth um, has different colors. So the traditional kind of the main peppered moth here is this white one with a little bit of flecks of gray and black in it. That's why it's called peppered. And then here is the same moth. You can barely see it, but it is there. And it's the same species but it's called polymorphism, different appearances. So this one's a lot more melanin than this one does. And if you notice on this tree, this one stands out so much. A predator is more likely to attack this moth than this moth. The tree was lighter colored than the dark moth would stand out. So you would be analyzing how the 
color frequency of the alleles for light and dark coloration in peppered moths changed over time in pre- and post-industrial England in the lab today. Another example that's happening right now is coral reefs. So if you've been lucky enough to go snorkeling or scuba diving or even just swimming and you've seen coral reefs, they're really, really beautiful and they're a really important part of that entire reef ecosystem. If the corals themselves aren't healthy, then all the fish, all the sea stars, all everything that lives in that coral reef is going to suffer. And coral reefs are being affected by climate change. So how corals work is they form a symbiotic relationship, that's your ecology again, a symbiotic relationship with the algae, and the name of the particular algae is zooxanthellae. And those zooxanthellae live inside the coral. So here's kind of the coral skeleton. Inside it live these little tiny algae, and those algae photosynthesize. So they live inside the coral and they do photosynthesis, and they give part of the sugars they make to the coral. That's what the coral gets from the symbiotic relationship. And the zooxanthellae get a safe place to live and they get um, the nutrients that the coral can kind of filter through the water. These zooxanthellae are what gives the coral their colors. So all their colors that are really beautiful to see. If you haven't had a chance to go to a coral reef yet, I hope you get a chance. Um, when we can travel again, it's really beautiful to see. Um, and it's a relation between them that gives the color to the coral. So, but when the oceans get too warm and the clouds are change in the oceans, then the zooxanthellae, those algae, they're going to be expelled from the coral. The coral will actually force them out um, because of the way that the zooxanthellae, their metabolism, their way of living changes and affects the coral. So the coral will kick them out. And coral can live without zooxanthellae, but not for very long. So they can live for a few weeks that way. Um, and they look like this, they're bleached, they're white because all the color is gone because the zooxanthellae are gone. And then after some time, if it cools back down again and the zooxanthellae can come back, the coral can recover. And there are some coral reefs that have recovered, um, but there are quite a few where they have gone too long without zooxanthellae because the temperature has risen too much and the corals die. So if this continues, if this climate change continues and that environmental change in the water temperature for the corals, if that continues, what will happen? Well, we might have corals going extinct. And if, if corals are a keystone species, which they are, that can have a huge impact on a huge number of species in the ecosystem. And if corals are able to adapt, maybe some corals have a mutation that's going to allow them to survive better um, with, or longer without Susan Belly. Maybe those ones will survive and pass on their DNA and have offspring. And then that the new corals in the future will be ones that can live longer without Susan Belly. Who knows what will happen as far as evolution, but this is definitely a very strong selection pressure of the ability to withstand those warmer temperatures and live without Susan Belly. So for your drawing, you can choose to draw either example. It's up to you. This one you'll be seeing in the lab, and this is another example for you to look at. Either one is fine. Make sure you add color, though, both in the lab color. Okay, so let's talk about extinctions. So extinctions are natural. They are normal. They are part of Earth's history. They are part of biology. They're part of how Earth works. And in Earth's History, it's about four and a half billion years old our planet is. In the history of the Earth, 99% of the species that have ever lived on our planet are now extinct. So only 1% of the species that have lived in the history of the Earth are still extant, are still living. Okay? Um, so there's a rate of extinction that is totally normal and constant, and that's called the background extinction rate. And that's for species that are going to be outcompeted. Maybe they're not as well adapted to their environment as a competition, and they go extinct. And the average rate at one any one time is about 4% of species. So it's normal for about 4% of species to go extinct at a time. And the other 96% at that particular moment in Earth's history are going to be able to survive um, and continue to compete. But mass extinctions are some of these more famous ones. If we think about the dinosaur as a great example of a mass extinction, when there's some sort of major environmental change, a really big thing happens that affects the entire Earth, like an ice age, 
and that tends to result in huge amount of extinctions, up to 96%. So here the graph is a number of extinctions, and these peaks are mass extinctions. Some of them are bigger than others. This is still typically a mass extinction. It's not as many species, um, but there's huge mass extinctions. And when that happens, that's because the environment has changed so significantly that most of the organisms are not able to adapt in time. The change happened too quickly or was too big of a change and they couldn't adapt and they went extinct. But after mass extinction, after 96% of species have gone extinct, what's going to happen? Think about evolution in that context. Only 4% of species are left on the earth. What's going to happen? Well, a big thing that happens is there's a huge availability of resources, of ecological niches. There's no competition or very little competition. Maybe some predators went extinct, but their prey survived. And it's a huge burst of evolution. Lots of new species develop because they have all these little resources to them. Um, so in your drawing, your book, please make sure you carefully note the background extinction rate versus mass extinction. Okay, and use the units very important. It's millions of years. We're back 600 million years, very long time, and this is number of families, not number of species. Okay? So a classic example of this is what's called the Cambrian Explosion. So about 541 millions ago, millions ago, million years ago, there was a mass extinction. And this mass extinction event um, was caused by climate change. Um, and after that event happened, for most species of an extinct, there's a huge number of new species on Earth, the single largest amount at one time. And we know this from the fossil record. And we call this the Cambrian Explosion because it happened during the Cambrian Epoch. And most of the major animal groups that still exist on Earth first appeared during the Cambrian Explosion. And this is again because there's no competition, there's very little predation, it's all these resources, all these niches available, and species can just fill in those gaps. And so the overproduction component um, of, natural, of natural selection wasn't very strong because there's so little competition. So lots of new species evolve um, after a mass extinction event. Okay, that's the end of today's lesson. Your task, your lab you have to do, is to do this lab on environmental change and melanism. So you're gonna look at peppered moths, and here's the lab looks like. Um, this is meant to be the background of a tree, different colors trees of light and dark. Um, you're going to do one trial yourself and collect data from 1830 all the way to 2010, every four years. And then two classmates, will so you'll share your two classmates, you have three trials total, you can take the mean, do your graphing, all that kind of stuff. There is a how-to video on YouTube I put together um, to how to use the simulation. If you need some help, it's not super tricky, but it's not very clear when you first get started either. So feel free to look at that to help you out. Okay, so your homework is to complete the page from today's lesson and upload it to Schoology, as well as the Environmental Change Lab, Melanson Environmental Change. Um, again, you're doing this one trial by yourself. The other two are from other students. You just share data with each other. Um, it's not a quick one. It's going to take you at least 30 minutes just to collect the data and then you have to do the analysis. Okay, so give yourself some time to do this. Okay, and that's everything. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email your teacher. And have a good day, guys. Hope everyone's staying safe and sound at home.